So, hey everyone, my name is Nir, and I'm going to talk about Hunted Stung today. We had some technical difficulties, but I think we overcame it. So, you should be able to see the screen and you should be able to hear me. Um, Hunted Stung is based on a real world experience and a continuous search. Uh, done by myself and Melissa Bishoping. And Melissa, unfortunately, could not make it to B-Side this year, but believe me when I say that she is standing behind every word uh, in this presentation. So, next slide, please. So, who am I? Uh, my name is Nir. I'm currently a technical solutions engineer at Tenium. My background is threat intelligence. I started my career in the Israeli Intelligence Corp. And uh, I moved to the US shortly after 9-11, helping multiple uh, vendors and operating systems, uh, operating um, uh, SOC analysts with, the, with securities. Uh, what you see here is a photo of me at B-Side Delaware 2017. Uh, with uh, Joshua Marpet and Janice. Um, so those are the days where we could have attended B-Sides in person, but I'm happy to be here virtually. Um, the other activities you can see that I'm involved with is chess and basketball, um, obviously with my family, and you can use the uh, my handle key, which is uh, under the, the photo there. So next slide, please. So why this talk and topic? I'm incredibly vocal and, and passionate about some of the concepts uh, you'll hear today. I believe in security and I believe that security is a verb. It's something that you do and that there's a method to this madness. And if you keep on thinking, acting and working better, I believe that you would be able to get better results. So the old school mentality around security and detection is failing and giving you a false of sense uh, or a sense of false um, protection. I believe attackers are getting smarter and smarter. And I truly believe that together we can overcome those sophisticated attacks. And that's what we're going to talk about, some of the hunting capabilities. Now, to be secure is more than just stopping the behavior. Uh, it's basically being able to identify what a bad behavior looks like. And so a lot of attacks today are less detected by signatures, by EDRs. I mean, EDRs are important, important tools when it comes to using, detecting attacks based on signatures or known malwares. But if you look at the latest statistics from avtest.org, we're talking about over 1 billion distinct malwares. So there, practically there's no EDR out there that would be able to stop or detect even half of them. So we'll talk about in-memory attacks. We'll talk about living off the land, all of those activities that are really hard to be detected by EDRs. So next slide, please. Let's look at the overview. So I divided this talk into two sections. Part one is the boring stuff. So that's generally what people relate, relate to when we're talking about keeping the hygiene, mapping your network flows, uh, uh, updating your CMDPs. Those are boring things, maybe, but you're never going to get to part two if you are not very strict with part one. So we're going to go over some of the basic kind of eat your broccoli, brush your teeth activities in part one. The second part, we will go over the attack life cycle and see step by step, how can you improve your hunting capabilities? How you can find those opportunities for dumb, different and dangerous behaviors and how this can help you with your hunting processes, procedures. Um, you see here the steps. 
this is um, one idea of module can you can use for hunting, but hunting could be used for other modules like the diamond model or the, the typical cyber kill chain. Most importantly is to be able to bucket those phases of attack and be very clear on which type of attack phase are we hunting to. So let's move to the next slide. So the boring basics. This is the Maslow hierarchy of needs. The Maslow hierarchy of needs is the theory that motivates people to do whatever they do and dictate their behavior. The image below um, is was taken out of a presentation by Matt Swan, and it is being used to articulate what is the pyramid of hierarchy when it comes to hunting. And that explains why organizations cannot just move from zero to mature hunt. Uh, everyone gets really excited about threat intelligence. I get myself, believe me, that is the original um, uh, type of activity that I did. But the more I got into the market and worked with customer, I realized how important the base of this pyramid is. How important uh, is to know where your assets are, what they're doing, what's installed on them. Is your AV up to date? You know, favorite parts of the job will get there, but before we make sure we know our assets, we cannot move there. So make sure you map your security tools based on your assets. Don't focus on building hand capabilities if you have incomplete asset inventory and if half of the systems are not up to date. Specifically, if your organization is tight with budget and human resources, you'll do yourself a huge favor by starting identifying your assets. That will already make a massive improvement towards your response capabilities. So let's move to the next slide. So where do we start, right? I get this question a lot, especially when um, people are looking at, okay, what do you mean by ignoring the boring stuff? So this is definitely not a comprehensive list and I know it's much more complicated than what it looks here but it is a iterative process where you map your networks you understand where the assets are missing and what is important here is to really be ready and answer some of the fundamental questions and you know if you lack the tools to adequate you know to adequately keep an accurate inventory and you cannot really see all the data flow, flow that's fine. You have to start with something. And I, I'm sure that whatever you have within your organization can be used to help at least uh, on some of those activities. So this will help you to kind of get up the bottom of the pyramid. If you move into the next slide, the support resilience and detection. So what do we what do I mean by that? So even if the boring basics sounds boring, they're going to help you support structure and detection, response, resilience. One of the things you want to look at is anomalies. And when you look at anomalies, you're talking about creating baseline. What a normal user behavior in your environment should look like what a normal data flow should look like. If a person from HR is accessing a server within the finance department, which is not characteristic to any other peer in their group, that's an anomaly. If you see them working um, activities after nighttime, that's an anomaly. If you see two people, um, 
that uh, communicating that shouldn't be communicated or shouldn't have a communication between their endpoints. That's an anomaly. So use this data, but also cross correlate data coming in from different data sources in order to find those activities. Uh, those activities usually will show something that is out of the norm that could be either um, honest mistake or a malicious activity. So um, in, in my career, I worked with uh, a lot of SIM solutions, regardless of what solution you work with, a SIM is a good way for you to cross correlate the data and starting to put the timeline and the story behind those telemetries to get back from your endpoints. So moving to the next slide. So this is a list or a part of a list of detections capabilities or detection tools within your environment. I'm actually moving the slide. Give me one second here. So I don't expect you to have all of those detection tools. This is definitely a um, slide that just need to remind you that the, the attack sleeves artifacts and correlations of those actions uh, is the best way to work. A lot of the information you see here, you have today and might not even leverage, some of which you don't have. So this is an eye chart, but even if you don't collect, collect all of the data, uh, you might not, not have everything today. But what you do have, I guarantee you can use. So invest time in learning the data sources you have. Don't let those data sources exist in a vacuum. And while they're useful, they become even superpower when you can go on running statistics, analysis on them, timelining them, scoping them with multiple sources and so on. All right. So now that we are over with the boring stuff, let's go into the exciting part. Now, moving into the next slide, this is part two. This is where the modern attack behavior is getting into a place. And when I say modern, I mean it because we're seeing more and more in the recent years, the, uh, the attacks that aren't relying on a spray and pray or super noisy or easily detectable by EDRs. Gone are those days that a signature-based AV keeping you safe and sound. Human operations are highly motivated. They move with stealth. They can rapidly adapt to what they see in your organizations, and you need to be able to understand behavior. Additionally, the, the emergency of supply chain attacks. Supply chain attacks or signed malicious binaries means that Behavior is the primary, if not the only way for you to go. So what I'm saying here is look at behavior. That should help you find those activities based on the baseline um, and, and don't rely on your detection tools only. So let's move into the next slide. I don't think there's any B-side talk that I don't mention the pyramid of pain by David Bianco, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it, but it's so relevant. It's relevant to uh, threat intelligence analysis. It's relevant for incident response use cases, and it's relevant for hunting. Uh, and the idea here is that the higher you go on the pyramid, the more potential your intel has and the more resources your adversaries have. And it's much higher or much harder for the adversaries to change their tech, the TTPs and tools rather than the hashes and IPs, right? You know, changing a hash of a file is trivial. It's only one bit and the file needs a, to be flipped. Uh, whereas changing the malware communication back into command and control, uh, that's much more annoying uh, for the adversaries. But also it's much harder for us as defender to identify. But those are the things that 
we as threat hunter needs to look at. Most resilient security programs will incorporate some level of threat hunting in the higher level of this pyramid based on Intel, based on TTPs, um, based on MITRE attack framework. Um, and the higher you go, the better you off with regards to identifying threat hunting, not specifically to one operation, but uh, generally to a threat that um, your specific organization is under. So uh, moving to the next slide. So what I did is looked at the different type of findings and dividing it into three buckets. The simple stuff, the stuff that we all should have been taking care of long time ago, but the reports uh, still show that people use them. The, the RDP, the um, non-encrypted script, the um, open public web servers, whatever, those things um, are still there. The difference, the things that you as a threat hunter haven't done in the past and figure out that makes sense for you. And the dangerous, those are the things that basically having this red flag, alarm is, is going off and you are in an incident. So the idea is to help your organization differentiate between those three. So you would be able to quickly trash each one of them and build those from the top, uh, sorry, from the bottom up, right? Uh, the quality of security program should include the uh, basic stuff, then move into the more sophisticated one and eventually end up with the response uh, solutions for those um, obvious attacks. So let's move into the next slide. So I really love the graphics here, and that was taken out of Aptic's presentation. Lull beans are used at every stage of the attack, but they're especially valuable for this initial code execution and defense evasions because you already trust them. They probably aren't doing anything to your EDRs or the analysis tools because they're already there, they're norm. Don't sleep on this. Even in the last week, we can see new exploits leveraging the same trusted services. Those makes the powerful weapon for fileless malware attacks. Uh, and when you have a file dropped on a disk that you'll catch, fileless malware and a lullbin together, only behavior can help you here. Yeah, I have a reference to a loud bus project, which identify those um, candidates for, for loud beans, those files that are mostly used by the bad guys. Um, and I encourage you guys to look at that project and, and learn a little bit more about what is being used within your environment. And moving into the next slide, initial access. So those first action in your environment, the fish that got clicked, the, the service exploited, the email, the Citrix, VPNs, like we had in the Colonial Pipeline event. This is your first line of defense. 75% of pen tests involved situations where MFA did not exist. Yeah, MFA. Um, I worked for a company that, that um, tried to elevate the, the, the pain of MFAs, but MFAs are important. And I know that they're not a silver bullet and there's still some steam attacks happening, but you know what? It's better to have them than not. So make sure you're protected with MFA. Monitor those logins. Monitor the DNS records for unusual requests. Monitor the email security providers for sudden upticks in, in blocks messages that could potentially show that you're a target. Uh, supply chain attacks, they're terrifying. How are you going to defend your organization from 
SCA, when it is signed, it's trusted, you trust the vendor, maybe you even give them a domain administrator, which by the way, please stop doing only by watching behavior. So make sure you look at those things. And also um, I wanna make mention here on the dismissant of the slow priority PUA alerts. Uh, while it, it may look like adware or low threat banking Trojan, multiple big name attacks start with a PUA and then download a payload that is much, much more dangerous for your system. So please uh, keep that in mind. Um, moving into the next phase in the attack, persistent. In your first, you know, persistent, as you know, uh, as a threat actor, this is what gives you the way back in case the system reboots uh, or process is crashed or the initial point access is discovered. And this is where obvious stuff like order run and startup keys uh, are obvious, but think about office. Office trusted locations are very attractive because it literally launches all the time. And by a change of a registry key, you can run a DLL under that context. And as you can see here, the lol bins are, again, not just abusing them, but maybe even replacing them. Uh, this is where system baseline and known hashes of a valid configuration elements could be powerful. So I've seen attacks where uh, the attackers are trying to get a hold of the uh, office keys, but they cannot do it because the user has to be an admin because the hive is under local, uh, the local uh, computer hive. But you can also use a user account hive and create a custom registry. And so there's ways around it. So be aware that even with a local account, you can still uh, create some damage around persistence. I'm moving to the next slide. So the next step is privilege escalation. It's rare, possibly unheard of for an attacker, especially a human one, to gain initial access and not attempting to escalate from there. The challenge with human operators is that they can be very slow. They can be as stealthy as they want, and they often react to detection techniques as they engage with. So it's a human against human game and doesn't make it easy. What you can do about it? Well, start by cleaning up your hygiene, right? Leaving the credentials out at the open, that's not smart and that also ruined the, the whole the fun of the red teams. So make it a little bit harder for everyone and use least privileged approach. Um, and if you're talking about hunting, again, anomalies, anomalies, anomalies. Know what your normal east to west traffic looks like. Um, harden your service account. Um, not only the permission, but also make sure the type of logons and the access are to only specific servers. And believe me, I was in this vendor side and I know they sometimes will come to you and say that they have to have a domain admin. Push back on that. Process injection. Look for those PowerShells. PowerShells are very, very strong and making outbound connections from a PowerShell is very weird. Make sure you capture those. But even PowerShell injection, a browser making outbound connection should be weird. So look at those as well. So make sure you uh, see um, how obfuscating uh, is done behind the account and how the bad guys abuse our permission creeps. Uh, we're moving to the next slide and to defense evasion. That's another, another favorite use case for lolmins here. The bad guys blend in with, with naturally occurring environments and 
they abuse the intended function or they just hijack them. Uh, you can take some mitigation options. Don't let your user just run every low bin. A lot of times, some of the services in your user's environments have no use. If there's no business use for them, they shouldn't be there. Realistically, if you don't need them, don't run them. So think about list privilege um, as something that applies to your applications on your operating system as well, not only for new third-party application you buy. Then for your service accounts. It will require some work. You will have to identify the um, network flows. It might require some politics, but it can be done. And investing the time and the tooling into monitoring and remediating and configuring and reconfiguring those configuration drift um, will keep on the windows and doors closed and will reduce dramatically the amount of opportunities uh, for the attackers. Uh, disable, bypass the security tools for troubleshooting because you need to do that, that's fine. Put it back. Uh, don't forget uh, to get back into your hardened configuration after troubleshooting. Next. Discovery. So this slide could have been anywhere. It could have been in the beginning, at the end, because it's an iterative process that keeps occurring. Uh, I left it here, but just know that discovery isn't a point of time thing. It's an every day, every step kind of a thing. Every now and again, someone can tell you, all right, well, just block Nmap and I'll be fine. And what I'm trying to tell them is that it's not about the tools, it's about the behaviors. Blocking Nmap will not prevent the bad guys from enumerating and scanning your networks. There are other tools that do that. I can throw you a list of bash commands that will find a lot of information and will enumerate all your active directories. So PowerShell is definitely a favorite tool for this kind of stuff. And so many people don't script block logging. That is really recommended. And it's powerful because you can not only see what happened, but you can de-obfuscate the commands um, in real time. Uh, another thing is about the norms of who's doing the um, enumerations. So if we have a, an IT guy that is trying to study for NetPlus and doing it on their machine, that might be a norm. Uh, but if it's something that is using a service account and is doing it out of the break room, that's probably not norm. So again, context is really important when you look at those kinds of behavior. And the power lies here in putting it all together, right? Maybe one thing is not that scary, but if it accommodate or accumulate rather to a story, then it's something else. Next slide. Ransomware is getting profitable. The FBI reports that while there were only 20% increase in reported ransomware events, the ransoms paid increased in 200% just last year. And this is because ransomware actors know that the value is in extortion not necessarily getting the ransom payment, but the dangerous, what you can get you is, the encryption is okay if you have a backup, but the threat is if they sell your encrypted data, that's a compelling motivator. And if they get the data exfiltrated, they can sell it, but they cannot sell it or extort it is if you can, isolate the, the machine. If you can find uh, through your hunting work, uh, those activities prior to exfiltration. And that's why detecting in this stage is so important. Um, 
and obviously having the tools that allows you to quickly isolate scope and remediate uh, those patients want machines and identify any other affected endpoint within your environment. So it is um, obviously a combination of the right tool set with the right processor, processes in, in place. So we're getting towards the end of, of that talk. Um, I hope I managed to cover at least some ideas that you guys can go back into your organization and look at. Uh, as we mentioned, you have to start with the hygiene. Um, answer the basic questions on your assets and their configurations, their vulnerabilities. Make sure you cover those. Once you cover them, look at where the hanging fruits are. Start there. And tie it back together. You have to get all the foundations out of the way and look at behavior hunting at the endpoint. And if you can see, analyze, correlate behavior, that's where you should start at. I myself uh, remember looking at uh, processes associated with um, identifying malicious activities within a specific financial company. And what tripped us there was access that was not really similar to any access we saw in the past. It was actually a user that was not able to log in. And I was an anomaly, but the, the, the fact that really scared us and was that after a lot of failures, that specific user managed to log in into the machines. And when he logged into the machines, the next event we saw was he was logging in into one of the executive's machines. And the funny part is that security guys were not concerned until the last step. And um, what, what we we're trying to say is that the fact that someone managed to log in um, after multiple failures, it could be a password spray, it could be just an honest mistake, but take a look at that and try to cross correlate. See if that specific endpoint is managed, it's unmanaged, is on the Wi-Fi. Uh, if you have um, this hunting census that we were trying to talk about on today's call, you probably be able to look at those things that were until now not important or not important enough to something that you can real quick um, assess as benign or suspicious and move from there. So I hope that was helpful. Um, in closing, I don't know if everyone is familiar with that last uh, slide here. Um, this is from Dune. Um, you know, some technologies such as social media, wireless technologies, those are all new technologies that have long been incorporated into threat models and is part of our landscape. And obviously moving to the cloud, you know, one of the major trends across the cybersecurity landscape is the businesses increasing moving the IT infrastructure to the cloud. And so what I like on that scene is um, from Dune is the discussion around change. And I'll cite here what uh, it uh, from the movie it says, I'll miss the sea, but a person needs um, experiences. They jar something deep inside, allow him to grow. Without change, something slip inside us and seldom awaken. The sleeper must awaken. And so, yeah, we need change. And I think some of the things we do at B-Sides is to push for those changes. Have this amazing community keep on pushing uh, for things that we believe should be changed as far as best practices within our security. And that's what I was trying to do on today's call. Uh, so with that, I want to thank you. And um, I have some additional pictures from B-Sides uh, at the last slide. And I really hope that um, we all can meet very soon in person and have those events, uh, you know, drinking uh, um, beer and, and 
just having fun together. So thanks for your time.